we talk about uh, awards for progress and civil liberties. We talk about the importance of independent thought um, and, and the history of it. And this is really what it is. You know, I, I, I did sign up to work for the government. Um, I volunteered uh, for the Army. I, <laughs> I applied to the CIA. I worked as a contractor uh, in NSA facilities on NSA computers uh, again and again and again. People think contractors like you're working in a different building, but no, you're, you're in, it's just a con continuation of government service. And also you joined the military after 9-11 because you wanted to fight. I did when everyone else was protesting. I was a younger man uh, and I was uh, much less politically educated. I'd like to think than I am uh, today. You know, some things only come with experience. Uh, but so, yeah, it, it raises this question of how does, you know, how does someone like who I was become someone like who I am? Um, and I got to tell you, it was hard. It, it wasn't easy. It wasn't natural. It wasn't something I ever expected to do. Uh, but like I said, I signed up to all of these things. I, I volunteered because I believed uh, in a prevailing uh, national mythos uh, to which we are all subscribed uh, when we're born into our country, when we go to a school system where we're basically the only one in the world uh, where you get up in the morning and you pledge allegiance to a flag. Uh, we all have the same stories. Um, we all watch the same uh, channels. You know, uh, We see men like you on, on TV uh, kind of telling us um, what's happening in the world and what it's like. And what changed me um, was a realization that as someone who held a top secret clearance and, and had access far beyond uh, what a top secret clearance would entitle someone to generally, the private truths of what was actually happening in our government, what our government actually does, uh, what our nation was involved in without the knowledge or consent of the people that it purports to represent um, was very different than the public representation of it. And that, really just that seed alone um, was the sort of journey that would take me many years uh, to ultimately realize and the decision, as you said, um, to come forward. Uh, and the ultimate reason why I came forward was simply to bridge that gap in my own experience and, and share that with everyone else, to share the realization that I came to, that what we were being told is true and real and is the state of our world, uh, was in fact a witting and continuing lie uh, by some of the highest representatives in our government. And I felt that people needed to know that. What was the lie? I think the most famous one um, for me, and really, uh, you know, the, the turning point um, would be when you look at uh, the exchange between um, Senator Ron Wyden and then Director of National Intelligence, uh, James Clapper. Uh, this is a sworn testimony in, in front of uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, and for those who don't remember it, because it was uh, some time ago, it looked a little bit like this. <laughs> So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. Uh, now, the importance of this is to, to think about what that represented. Um, this, of course, was, was false. The NSA was collecting uh, the phone records of every Verizon customer uh, on a daily basis. Um, they were doing this for other major telecommunications providers as well. I just didn't have the judicial order for that. Um, and this was happening to the Internet. This was happening to email communications. What was happening was... Uh, a change in technology from the old internet that was uh, a sort of non-commercial, very individual and simple. Uh, it was pretty crude. Everything was cobbled together to this larger, more corporatized internet where all of our communications, all of our interactions, all of our relationships, all of the things that we read and like online um, are being passed to us through a Facebook or a Google or an Apple. And in secret, these, um, these companies uh, had basically gone far beyond what the law required 
uh, of government to join programs where they would share information with the NSA through the front door of the FBI. Uh, and it was continuing for years without the kind of individual warrants and um, legal process that we expected uh, and we had become accustomed to that we're told in the Constitution, this is how our government works. And so for me, uh, when you ask what was the, the lie, um, the lie was not any one particular part of these programs. It wasn't a particular detail. It was the fact that there was a breathtaking sweep of intentional knowing public deception uh, by people at the level of the Senate, by people in these uh, different executive agencies, um, uh, intelligence agencies, and then in the White House itself, even from the president, uh, then President Barack Obama, who campaigned on ending warrantless wiretapping that he had criticized so heavily in the Bush administration, um, but had in fact, in secret, uh, extended and embraced uh, these programs and these authorities uh, to a level that I began to feel had uh, truly narrowed the boundaries of our rights. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. We are not authorized to do it, nor do we do it. You were at the NSA and you're dealing with these secrets before you even saw the head of the National Security Agency on TV. And what did you think about them then? Well, so this was the, the thing. When you look at the arc of my career in intelligence, um, I was always working on the technical aspect uh, of it. And so by and large, I was uh, modernizing our systems because post 9-11, uh, the intelligence community realized they weren't very good uh, <laughs> at using technology. They thought they were. Um, and in a way, uh, it was true that they were, but it was a different era's technology. They were great with radio. They were great with satellite. They weren't so good with computers. They weren't so good with the internet. So they brought in a bunch of shaggy young guys who looked like me. And they really liked what you did, and you were a star. A absolutely. But it wasn't that I was, you know, exceptional, um, so much that I represented a generation that was native to these new systems uh, that they had shied away from because they didn't trust the security of them. It turned out with good reason. Um, but uh, my generation came in, we shared our experiences, we shared our specialties, and we were always looking at what we were doing through a straw. Um, and you have to understand these principle that we hear of in the movies, you know, need to know, um, means normally you get a project, you do a project, you don't know where it goes, you don't know who else is using it. Um, but bit by bit, I was uh, redirecting and uh, collecting the flow of intelligence. Then I was backing it up, uh, permanizing it, uh, making it so that uh, if we lost a building, if we lost a site, we didn't lose everything that had passed through that, the information that had been passed through that. And I thought uh, this was information about terrorists. I thought this was saving lives. I thought this was preventing wars. Um, but as I moved higher and higher uh, in the organization, as I moved from CIA to NSA, um, as I moved from office to office, uh, my straw that I'm looking through gets wider and wider and wider until I land in this place called the Office of Information Sharing. It turned out I would be much better at this job than anyone expected. Um, and I saw everything. And it's only there uh, when you see the consequences of your uh, labor and the different parts of your career all brought together uh, with the labor of others of your entire generation who themselves, not sitting in the position you are, can't see the big picture impact of what they're doing. And the public, who never even knew this stuff existed, uh, and again, this was occurring without their consent, but in theory, uh, it was being carried out in their name, uh, it felt to me that we needed to know. We needed to actually decide, is this what we want to happen or not? And you talked to your supervisors. Yeah, I talked to my supervisors. I talked to my colleagues on Constitution Day. They were all fine with it. This is just what we do and no problem. Well, actually, actually it, it's not quite uh, that uh, people had no problems. When I brought up uh, these programs that many of them had never heard of because they hadn't been exposed to them, um, I said, does this look right to you? 
uh, when I show that we're collecting more internet communications in the United States uh, at the NSA than we were in Russia, right? Uh, meaning we are ingesting more Americans' communication than we are ingesting Chinese people's communications or uh, Russians' communications or North Koreans' communications or whoever you're afraid of, right? The bulk of our collection uh, was happening domestically and happening with the aid of uh, other partners in what's called the Five Eyes Network, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Um, and then the NSA would go, well, yes, we're collecting all of these communications, but we're not reading them all. We're capturing uh, everything that you, John Stossel, are doing online. We're capturing everything that your family's doing online, that your friends are doing online. But we just pinky promise it's not being used for anything bad. Um, and then, you know, being an engineer, I see how these things actually are being touched. They are being processed. They are being sorted through uh, every single day. Uh, algorithmically, uh, it sort of proves the lie, right, uh, that all of these promises, they don't really amount to much. All of these processes and regulations and procedures uh, don't amount to much. And in reality, what the NSA is doing every single day is ordinary course of business is violating not only the laws as written, but likely the Constitution. And I tell this to the guy sitting to my right, a good friend of mine. Say, tell this to the guy sitting to my left, a good friend of mine, uh, to my office manager, right? Um, and all of them actually in private, right? When, when you're not in email, uh, when they're just speaking heart to heart about this, they go, <laughs> no, you know, this, this is crazy. Um, I'm not sure why we're doing this. I'm not sure how we're doing this. I'm not sure this is legal. But you know what happens to people who talk about this, right? I wouldn't put this in writing. I wouldn't go you know, to this office or that office. They're not gonna do anything about it. It's not your job, it's not my job. This is way above our uh, pay level, basically. But what happens uh, to us as an organization at the NSA? What happens to us as Americans? Uh, what happens to us as a society if everybody sees something wrong and goes, well, if I say something about it, I'm gonna get into trouble. What happens if everybody goes, I'm not gonna do anything about this because it's not my job? Uh, that's how things go wrong um, in a much more serious way. And the reality was I was just like them. Uh, for a long time, I had, had a growing sense of unease, uh, but in reality, it was not my job to fix it. Uh, and this was actually one of the criticisms that was eventually leveled against me was they go, you know, who elected you? Um, but. It's not about you know, who you are. Um, it's about what you've witnessed. It's about what you can prove. And does that matter? And I think the, the last seven years when we've seen the courts review these programs and confirm that they were in fact unlawful, we've seen laws changed even by the legislature that was implicated in the wrongdoing in the first place. But at some point you decided, I'm not gonna keep my mouth shut. Yeah, I mean, it, it's exactly because of this. Um, if I keep my mouth shut, the guy to my right, the guy to my left, we, you know, we all think this is wrong and we all keep our mouth shut. Um, what does tomorrow look like? And the year after that, and the year after that, uh, the reality with um, these kind of extraordinary powers in government, uh, particularly, in, we all understand this now in the post 9-11 moment, because it's not just surveillance, it's happened in war, it's happened in international diplomacy, it's happened in economy with the financial crisis, how we bail out the banks, uh, but we don't bail out ordinary people. Um, when the government writ large identifies a moment of crisis, uh, they use that crisis for uh, an exceptional demand for exceptional powers to which they normally wouldn't be entitled. Uh, this was the rise of the Patriot Act, right? This was how uh, the Bush administration got involved in more or less wiretapping. This is how we got uh, extrajudicial killings through drone strikes uh, off the ground. Um, this is how we got involved in torture. But it's always uh, justified as, an, again, an exception to ordinary operations, uh, something that's done for a narrow purpose in a narrow way, um, but then nobody objects to it. Uh, these all happen in secret, remember. Um, they keep uh, the body of witnesses small by design to limit the amount of dissent that can occur uh, internally, organizationally. Um, and those who do complain are generally shuffled off the program. They're put in a closet somewhere uh, and they ride out their days to retirement if they're lucky, um, never doing anything that, that matters again, uh, but also not having access to anything that could cause problems for those who are 
violating people's rights or our laws. Um, but this, as you said, why speak up? Uh, if you sit by and see a system engaged in wrongdoing, uh, and you do nothing, uh, even if you don't participate in it any longer, uh, even if you resign, you are perpetuating a system of wrongdoing. You have become uh, not just part of the wrongdoing, but, but party to it. Um, and for me, uh, when we looked at this, this was affecting uh, the country that I love. This was affecting uh, the internet that I grew up with, which was, was practically part of my family uh, by this point in my life. Um, and then you extrapolate uh, from how we got involved in the, sort of this overreaching surveillance state to begin with, the national security state. Uh, and step by step, bit by bit, exception after exception, uh, these extraordinary and narrow authorities become permanent and perpetual authorities. Uh, and bit by bit, as the uh, domain of government expands, uh, the territory that is claimed to the people narrows. Uh, and this became such a concern to me uh, that I was willing to risk a great deal uh, to tell people about it and see if they agreed or if I was just crazy. My preference, and I think the American people's preference, would have been for a lawful, orderly examination of these laws, a uh, thoughtful, fact-based debate uh, that would then lead us to a better place. There were other avenues available for somebody whose conscience was stirred and thought that uh, they needed to question uh, government actions. So why go to certain members of the media? President Obama later said there were other avenues available for someone <laughs> whose conscience was stirred. Specter generals, Congress. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a great, um, uh, a great kind of question. I mean, we, we always look at these things. We don't want anybody in government uh, to be able to go out and, you know, throw any secret about anything uh, out on the media uh, willy nilly. And this is one of the primary institutional criticisms against me. On the other hand, are there uh, internal channels, as Obama posited? Uh, for me, no. Uh, even under the most generous reading of the law at the time, what he said was incorrect. Uh, and he said so at a time that, by the way, he knew it was incorrect, uh, even though it was politically useful, uh, because this had been debated in newspapers around the country by this point. Um, I was not an employee of the NSA. Uh, I was an employee at a private company that was contracted to do work for the NSA at NSA buildings, you know, uh, on NSA equipment. Uh, the only difference between myself and the actual NSA employee sitting to my right in the office uh, was he had a blue badge, I had a green badge. Green was for contractor, blue was for staff employee of government. Um, but the whistleblower protection laws uh, did not apply to contractors. This makes sense if you think about it uh, in the context of the moment, because how can the government uh, protect someone from complaints uh, when it's not actually their employee, right? How can the government prevent someone from de being disciplined when they're a private company for whatever purpose? Uh, and, and the reality is there was, even if I had gone through an internal purpose, or sorry, internal process, uh, had I gone to Congress, had I gone to the president uh, himself, uh, the ultimate result would have been the same. Um, I would have been stopped at some level by an individual like the NSA uh, inspector general, uh, who is supposed to be kind of a watchdog that makes sure the NSA's activities uh, are legally compliant or the Office of General Counsel, I would have been uh, terminated from my position. Uh, I would have been investigated by the police and I very likely would have been charged under exactly the same laws uh, that I've been charged under today. We know this uh, not because I'm speculating and throwing this out of air, but because it had happened before in the case of a former NSA executive at a much higher level than myself, um, by the name of Thomas Drake, who did go through proper channels and whose story I was very familiar with because I was determining, should I do this? Is it right? Will it work? Will it be effective? William Binney, who was charged with uh, Thomas Drake at the same time or investigated at the same time as uh, Thomas Drake for the same disclosure. He had men with guns drawn come into his house at dawn. Yes, exactly. You have the FBI burst in your house. They take all your computers. They arrest you. You know, uh, they interrogate you. You lose your clearance. You lose your job. First, I went to the House Intelligence Committee and the staff member that I personally knew there. And uh, she then went to the chairman of that committee. We were all trying to work internally in the government for over these years, trying to get them to 
come around to being constitutionally acceptable and take it into the courts and have the courts oversight of it too. We naively kept thinking that that could, uh, that could happen and uh, it never did. They decided to uh, raid us to keep us quiet, threaten us, you know. In my case, they came in with guns drawn. I don't know why they did that, but they did. Thomas Drake, uh, who was an executive at the top of the U.S. intelligence community, uh, now works at an Apple store, right? Um, but it's important to understand that he did go through proper channels. He did everything right. And when he went to these officials, this is what they said. This is the Office of General Counsel uh, at the NSA, a uh, man by the name of Vito Potenza. If he came to me, someone who was not read into the program and told me that we were running amok, essentially, and violating the Constitution, there's no doubt in my mind I would have told him, you know, go talk to your management. Don't bother me with this. I mean, you know, you, you, you did the, the minute he said, if, if he did say, you're using this to violate the Constitution, I, I mean, I probably would have stopped the conversation at that point, quite frankly. So, I mean, if that's what he said he said, then anything after that I probably wasn't listening to anyway. And this is the reality, and I think everybody understands this naturally. These internal watchdog shops in government, they're great if you need to report sexual harassment. They're great if you need to uh, report some kind of discrimination, if somebody's stealing office supplies. If you go, uh, the entire agency of government is engaged in a conspiracy uh, to deceive the public about the reality that we are right now uh, working in concert across agencies uh, to uh, carry out a program that is in violation not only of law but the Constitution, um, they're not equipped to handle that and they're not interested in investigating that. Uh, that's not why they were appointed. I got to say, in my endless hundred year career, no one has ever rolled in video before. That's usually what I need to do. If you ever get it's back. A new, right? I'm a technologist. Sorry, I can't help it. That's good. All right. Why do you think you were charged under the Espionage Act? That's pretty rare. To send a chilling message. To whom? To other whistleblowers, to others in the government, not to speak out or speak out. Do not tell truth to power. We'll hammer you. Drake on 60 Minutes, where he said it, it, the purpose was to send a chilling message. Do not tell truth to power. We will hammer you. I think that that's absolutely correct. When you look at the lived experience of whistleblowers, uh, and again, these are separated by decades of, uh, you know, different White Houses, different presidents, different administrations, different Congresses, different policies. The response is always the same. Um, if someone inside of government reveals government wrongdoing, uh, at the level uh, that threatens the reputations and certainly the electability uh, of whether we're talking about agency heads, whether we're talking about uh, politicians, um, whether in the legislature or the executive uh, branches, uh, their first priority is to stop you from talking uh, because they want to control the narrative. And, and this is really what this is about. When you look at all of this mass surveillance, um, whether we're talking about internet surveillance, whether we're talking about uh, telephonic surveillance, um, whether we're talking about domestic surveillance, whether we're talking about international surveillance. Um, you've been in the news a long time. You've seen these officials. You've interviewed these officials. Uh, they constantly tell us, uh, this is for your safety. This is to investigate terrorists, right? And I kind of believe it. Right. And we all believe it to some extent, particularly when we share the national trauma of 9-11. Um, but when you look uh, from the inside as an employee at what we're doing with this. I see all the reporting, right? I've got access to all the reporting. And then you look at things that happen in the wake of scandal. For example, after I came forward, Obama, who was facing extraordinary pressure, appointed two independent commissions to investigate these programs so, because he was trying to um, basically justify these things and find where they were accurate, where they were useful. Uh, this was the uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board and the President's Review Group uh, on Intelligence and Communications Technologies. Both of these groups had full access to classified information. Uh, both of them talked to uh, all sides of the intelligence community. They went to the FBI, they went to the CIA, they went to the NSA. Uh, and they said, look, we've got the clearances. Uh, give us your success stories. Show us where this helped. Show us where this saved lives. Show us why we should be doing this. Um, and they looked, uh, because at the time, you know, uh, we had people, uh, we had Keith Alexander, then uh, director of the National Security Agency, going in front of Congress, going on TV and saying, you know, this stopped 47 plots or whatever. Um, you know, people are alive, buildings are up because of these programs. Well, Barack Obama's own investigations into this 
uh, found that in the case of the very first uh, program that we looked at, uh, this was the mass surveillance of telephone records direct, domestically, um, it didn't stop a single terrorist attack in more than 10 years of operation. And that's happening in secret, mind you, uh, before it hits the front pages and all of that stuff. Um, and in the only case, uh, they also found, sorry, that it never made a concrete difference, and that's their words, in a single counterterrorism investigation. There were plots that were found, but the court found that they had other, they already had the information. They didn't need all this spying. We've heard over and over again the assertion that 54 terrorist plots were thwarted. That's plainly wrong. These weren't all plots, and they weren't all thwarted. The American people were getting left with uh, inaccurate impression of the effectiveness of NSA programs. They actually never discovered a plot through these programs. Never. Not once. Uh, what they did do is they found information related to a plot um, in a single case, and this was a cab driver uh, in California, uh, Moallen, I believe, um, wiring uh, about $8,500 uh, to his clan in Somalia, which was affiliated with Al-Shabaab, which was uh, on a terrorism list, by, according to the State Department. Um, this was their great success story, right? And in this case, uh, judges had, uh, or sorry, we had already had watchdogs go through it, thanks, fortunately, to Obama in this case. Um, and now we have since had courts go at it and look at, uh, confirm it was unlawful. And it was unnecessary. And mind you, this is with access to the classified record because they said, by the time the government had enough information to look these guys up in the NSA database, you know, CIA, FBI, whatever. They also had enough evidence to go to a court through traditional means uh, and get a warrant uh, without relying on all this, right? You didn't have to collect this uh, by violating the rights of, you know, 330 million Americans when you simply could have used the old traditional means of law enforcement to get exactly the same material from exactly the same companies uh, without breaking the law. It's dozens of um, terrorist events that these have helped uh, prevent. The uh, tip of the iceberg in terms of numbers of terrorist attacks that NSA programs contributed to stopping was 54. Keith Alexander says these programs helped prevent dozens of terrorist events. The deputy director, the reason there hasn't been a major attack in the United States since 9-11 is not an accident. The number of terrorist attacks the NSA programs contributed to stopping is 54. That makes me feel safer when I hear that. <laughs> right, and, but we want to believe it's true, but it's not. This 54 number has been um, looked at uh, intensively uh, by advocates and apologists for the national security state, by critics of it. Uh, and since then, it's boiled down again to, I believe, one case uh, and this one case in this is not uh, is Somalian wiring $8,500. Um, I believe it's some you know guy with mental illness who was thinking about uh, bombing a subway uh, in New York. But it's the same context, the same thing. They didn't need this authority. It wasn't necessary. Because look, uh, let's say you, don John Stossel, uh, work at the NSA. You do the job I did in my last position. You go in every day. Uh, you've got the desk in front of you with your keyboard uh, connected to a system called X Key Score. This is uh, basically Google for spies, right? Uh, it allows you to search through all of the different uh, methods of ingestion uh, that we have, not just domestically, but overseas through our partners um, in what we call second party countries. These are these Anglophone countries and the five eyes I mentioned earlier, as well as third party partners. Uh, we have sensors, you know, all over the world, some of them placed by hacking, some of them placed in data centers. Uh, and you can type anybody's phone number in, anybody's email in, any website in, any IP address for a phone or a, a computer, a laptop. And you can see all the traffic uh, that has passed any of these sensors. Um, you can uh, write to your FBI analyst buddy and have them pull anybody in the world's uh, Basically, a whole Facebook list uh, of everything they've ever clicked on, anything that the Facebook pixel tracker was on the website for when they were reading things, uh, their Amazon order history, you know, everything they've typed in that Google search box ever. You have access to everything, right? And you want to stop a terrorist plot. How do you know who to look up? And this is why these programs don't actually stop terrorism. You have to have a seed. You have to have something to start your searches from. You have to have a cause for suspicion. Uh, traditionally, under the Fourth Amendment, uh, we require probable cause for these kind of investigations to begin. Uh, police officers get a tip, 
from someone. They notice something when they're working the beat. They know their communities. They see someone acting strange. They get a complaint and they investigate on this basis, right? Well, in intelligence, the way these tips come across uh, is generally from the same thing. It's from a confidential informant. It's from law enforcement. It's from whatever. Uh, but once you have this, once you have probable cause to begin investigating someone, you can go to a court, you can get a warrant, you can access the same information without collecting it from the entire internet before, right? And so this is the thing. Um, when you look at the fact that the government itself no longer makes these claims that it stopped 54 plots, right? They have disowned that. Keith Alexander no longer works for the NSA. He's uh, out. Now he works uh, on the board of directors at Amazon.com. Um, the, the thing is, what are these things effective for, right? Because you go, well, why does the government pay for these programs? Why go to all this trouble if it doesn't stop attacks? Yeah, why? <laughs> and the, the answer, of course, is because these programs are tremendously useful for something different. Uh, and that is information gathering, right? Intelligence, general investigation about anything on anyone. It may not be effective in preventing terrorist attacks. Uh, because again, it's not uh, particularly more useful relative to the tools that we already have. Because uh, again, terrorism is rare. It is scarce. And people don't realize this uh, based on the way the media has changed. But the incidence of terrorism uh, over time is actually declining relative to the last century. If you look at, for example, terrorist attacks in Western Europe, uh, they have declined decade over decade. Uh, since like the 1960s, people forget about it, but things Maybe like Maybe because of intelligence and the NSA. <laughs> well, again, I work for these agencies and I would like to believe that was true, but the rate at which they were falling is completely different from the rate of mass surveillance. And this is what people uh, misunderstand about my politics and my positioning. Um, I am not against the use of intelligence. I'm not against the existence of intelligence agencies. I'm not against surveillance. I am against mass surveillance. And this is what I brought information forward about. Just to play devil's advocate here, why should I care? I, I figure Google and Facebook knows everything about everybody. Anyway, I figure the teenage boy across the street could be picking up the <laughs> stuff I sent. It, the, the cork's out of the bottle. What difference does it make? This goes back to kind of that, that nothing to hide argument, which is like... Um, I lead a very ordinary life. Uh, I watch my shows. I go to work. I take care of my family. Uh, yeah, I'm weird. Yeah, I look at porn. You know, uh, if we're, we're talking about the average person on the internet, everybody looks at porn, right? It's happened. Um, even if you don't want to, there's a pop-up ad somewhere. It's in your history. Um, but the reality is most people do, and they want to. Uh, and that's not strange. Um, people, particularly Americans, feel an enormous sense of shame about this, but it's a tremendously common activity. At the same time, it makes us feel uncomfortable, you know. Um, for a lot of us, as our family knew everything that we looked up on the internet, uh, we would worry about how they would look at us. Um, if, you know, the, every company in the world knew everything that you looked at, we would feel uncomfortable with it. But then what happens when your workplace knows? Uh, what happens when your government knows? And who decides what is normal, what's acceptable, and what's not, right? We can do things that are very common today, or we can have positions uh, or interests that are very uncommon today, but harmless. In a free society, we are allowed to be different. We are allowed to be weird. We can be strange as long as we're not hurting anyone else. But laws change, social mores change, the norms shift. Uh, and once we are entered into this system, where everything we've ever done, everything we were ever interested in, everything we've ever bought, everywhere we've ever gone, everywhere that we have, or anyone that we have ever talked to, is instantly captured the moment it happens and memorialized in some database somewhere just waiting to be used, uh, it will be used. And we already see this happening in places like China, right? We don't want to emulate China, where we have a social credit system, uh, where things that you do which are harmless, which aren't hurting anyone, uh, but institutions or railways or airlines or the Communist Party that sweeps into power or is already in power decides is disfavored and should be penalized, should be disincentivized. Now you can no longer get a job. Now you have to wait uh, you know, and go to the local police station to get a pass to be able to travel and visit your family. Uh, we cannot anticipate these things. And the problem is that I have with this idea of argument 
is that we should have to, that we should have to prepare for it, that we should think and constrain our intellectual curiosity and even, frankly, our weirdnesses, our distinctions, our differences, our weirdness, the things that place us in the minority because we could potentially someday be judged on the basis for it, even if we have done nothing wrong, even if it wasn't strange, because the definition of what is wrong is constantly changing. If Google's got it and Facebook has it, why is it so much worse that our government has it? This is, this is a great question. There's two ways uh, that this is typically um, responded to. Uh, one, and this is one that I used myself um, many years before, is that, well, the difference is uh, Google can sell you a different pair of shoes on the basis of what it knows about you, right? The ads that it places on the side of your bar. Um, but they can't put you in jail. They can't bomb you, right? Uh, the government can, and for a lot of people, the government does. Uh, the second thing, which I think is actually more interesting, um, it requires a, a little bit more technical understanding of how these programs are implemented, but not so much that I think it loses even a general audience. Google knows an incredible amount about an incredible number of people, but it is still finite. There are things that they do not know. Uh, Google does not necessarily know what you bought on Amazon. Google does not necessarily know what you liked on Facebook. Uh, Google, do Google does not necessarily know what you posted on Instagram. Facebook knows what you posted on Instagram because they own that, right? Amazon knows what you bought on this, but they don't know what you sent in your email. It's on uh, uh, Google because it's a Gmail account, right? There are silos in industry uh, that even if they're very large, still limit what these different companies know. The maximum domain uh, of their understanding of you as an individual and us broadly uh, as a population. Government, however, through its course of authorities in these kind of systems, uh, is able to look into each of these different silos uh, and then collate them together. They see everything that Facebook sees as well as everything that Google sees, as well as everything that Amazon sees, as well as everything that your phone provider sees, as well as everything that your airline provider has in terms of your travel history, uh, you know, and so on and so forth to an extraordinary extent. There are no um, limitations placed on this beyond the uh, their appetite and willingness to pursue uh, these silos and find a way into them. Now, I... I'm a little embarrassed in that I'm a consumer reporter and I report on markets. I, I haven't done much on spying or military secrets, and I hadn't paid much attention to you. I got you confused before researching for this interview with Manning and Julian Assange, Snowden, which who did what? And but now that I've done the research, I conclude that you really got screwed. And <laughs> Yet you talk about this very dispassionately and thoughtfully. Aren't you pissed off? I mean, James Clapper lied to Congress and to the pe American people, and he wasn't fired. He served out his term in the Obama administration, and now he works for CNN. And Keith Alexander, <laughs> right, right. Uh, he- I think that's he, kind of a condemnation of the direction our media has, has gone in. Uh, but I understand your point. Absolutely. Keith Alexander now, now runs a private security firm appropriately and is on Amazon's board. They made out. You're in exile. Yeah, I mean, you don't do the kind of things that I did um, if you're a pessimist. Uh, you do them because you're an idealist. You believe that things can get better. You believe that we can do better. Um, when I came forward, uh, it was in recognition of the fact that there is a two-tiered system uh, to the way um, American society is ordered today. There are those in power uh, who operate largely behind a veil of secrecy. Um, and even, this applies even to people who aren't working for the NSA, right? This happens to, to congressmen. Um, it's very difficult to find out who they're meeting with. It's very difficult to figure out, uh, you know, what lobbyists are having conversations with who and, the, you know, what laws are being shaped and what uh, text is being written that is passed into law that uh, impacts all of our lives, but was corporately sponsored, right? And these people are getting donations to their campaign or famously the justice system. Uh, if you're uh, a young person from a minority community with limited access to uh, wealth and uh, especially education, um, you're going to be treated very harshly by our court system. Uh, but if you're one of these uh, made men, you know, working on a high level, <laughs> um, you will face a very different flavor of justice, shall we say. 
none in the case of those two guys who lied. <laughs> precisely, precisely, uh, or, or no justice at all. But that will never change um, unless we make it change, right? Power admits nothing without a demand. Government is not going to reform itself. Uh, and the only way that things get better anywhere is through sacrifice. Uh, we've known this since we crawled out of the swamp of history. Uh, if you want to stay warm, uh, somebody is going to have to go through the trouble of building a house. It's not going to be fun. They're not going to love it, but they're going to be doing it because it makes life better. Somebody out there is going to have to do the, the hard work of growing the food that we all, you know, survive on. Uh, and they don't get a lot of thanks for that, but <laughs> society is a team sport. Our society as exists today is flawed. I recognize that, right? Um, I am doing what I can to make it better as I can. I don't have any illusions uh, that I'm going to fix it. Uh, I'm not going to save the world. That's not how this works. Uh, and I think this is why uh, I can be very much at peace uh, with the choices that I've made and the, uh, unfortunately, the, the price that I've paid as a result of that because it was the right thing to do. And it has made things better. Even if it hasn't fixed the problem, uh, people now can understand these things. Uh, we can begin to argue for better policies. And in fact, they're already happening. Our courts, which for literally decades excused themselves at all um, from uh, weighing in on the legality and constitutionality of surveillance in the context of national security, uh, have since 2013, when I came forward, ruled repeatedly on these programs and repeatedly ruled against uh, the government uh, that he, they had backstopped these things fully for, uh, again, for a very, very long time. The NSA is engaged in repeated, substantial legal violations. The FISA court called a systemic noncompliance by the government. But the programs go on. Some of these programs have been halted. Uh, Section 215 of the F Patriot Act is no more. Um, this was uh, ended uh, by an act of Congress and also at the urging uh, of or no less than Barack Obama, who uh, at the very beginning of 2014 Interesting in terms of timing, after the very first court to rule against these programs said it was likely unlawful and unconstitutional, came out in his State of the Union speech and said, although he could never condone what I did, uh, he felt that this conversation about surveillance, its legalities, its limits, had made us stronger as a nation. And he uh, urged Congress to pass what was then called the USA Freedom Act to uh, basically put new legal restraints on this. But as you say, uh, that didn't end the problem of mass surveillance. Uh, that just pushed the tube of toothpaste, right? Now the toothpaste is in a slightly different part of the same tube. Uh, however, mass surveillance occurs uh, largely through certain technical uh, principles, uh, certain vulnerabilities mechanically in the way our communications move from your phone or the laptop on your desk across the internet to whoever it is you're trying to communicate with, right? Whether we're talking about a website, uh, whether we're talking about um, someone that you're talking to on the phone. Uh, now, uh, fewer and fewer people use plain voice. Fewer and fewer people use plain SMS. Now they're using encrypted messengers like the Signal Messenger or WhatsApp, which I would not trust myself for a long period of time uh, because it was bought by Facebook. But uh, WhatsApp was the world's most popular messenger. It had 1 billion users and post-2013, they adopted uh, a new technical uh, protection called end-to-end -end encryption, um, which is intentionally designed to limit precisely the kind of mass surveillance that was being discussed in 2013. So now, at the flip of a switch, one billion people get a greater level of privacy that is not reliant on jurisdiction, it's not reliant on law, it's not reliant on politics. And the encryption works? Encryption does work. Uh, one of the lessons uh, as a result of 2013 uh, all these disclosures about how the NSA works, how the surveillance works, um, uh, is <laughs> uh, you can be sneaky in a lot of ways uh, as the NSA, as the CIA, when you're trying to steal a secret. But encryption is basically just math. Um, and there is no, currently, with the best knowledge that we have of mathematics, any sneaky way to just make encryption go away entirely from uh, a point of interception, right? So as, again, your phone tries to reach this other person, uh, wherever they are in the world, it has to go through the network of many other people, through the Starbucks that you're sitting at, through their internet service provider, through a data center, through a transatlantic cable that goes to, for example, France, their data center, their local internet service provider, their Starbucks that they're sitting in. Any one of these points, uh, anybody sitting on that line 
can snatch a copy of the conversation. And if it wasn't encrypted, they can read it, whether it's a criminal hacker next to you uh, at the cafe uh, or whether it is a national government, be that the American government or the French government or anybody in between, right? Uh, but uh, the thing is, um, the only way really to get around strong encryption that is properly implemented is uh, precisely what the purpose of the 2013 stories was to achieve, which is to make governments shift from mass indiscriminate collection of communications to specific individualized targeted collection. This means hacking, right? So imagine for a second, you send this encrypted communication to the person that you're talking to. People in the middle, tons of them, they all catch it, they all collect it, but none of them can read it because an encrypted message cannot be unlocked without a mathematical key. It's just the answer to the math problem that you make up, that you share with the other person on the other side. You guys know the answer, but nobody else in the world can come up with it, right? Uh, now, um, mass surveillance no longer works. Game over, finish doesn't work quite that way. Uh, there's some more technical ways. We can talk about metadata later if you're interested, but it, it's more in depth. But the bottom line is how then, if you're the CIA and for example, this is not someone harmless in a Starbucks. This is an actual terrorist or a spy uh, or a dissident uh, in a place like Bahrain or Oman or Hong Kong, um, which unfortunately is all too real and happens every day. How do they read this message? And the answer is they steal a copy of the key. Uh, instead of catching it as it goes across the line, which they can no longer do, they can't do this for everybody en masse around the world, they have to target the two places in the world that that message is readable, where it's unencrypted. And that's on your device and the device of the person that you're talking with. Now, instead of dealing with encryption, instead of dealing with that global network, that easy, cheap mass surveillance, they do the hard work, the traditional targeted investigative work of hacking that phone or selling that person an implanted phone that's got spy devices built into it, basically. And then when that person is encrypting messages or when they're receiving messages and decrypting them, because they have taken over the phone, the encryption no longer matters to them because they can see it with unencrypted. They can steal that uh, encryption key, that, that answer to the math problem, when it exists on the phone before it's forgotten, before it disappears. Uh, so long and short, because I know that was probably uh, complicated for a lot of people, uh, encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, which is to say properly implemented encryption that doesn't have a man in the middle, doesn't have some Facebook, some Google who's keeping their own copy of the key, but uh, encryption where the keys are only held by the communicants, by the people who are supposed to know this information. Uh, that defeats mass surveillance in the generic general sense that we understood in 2013. It does not prevent all uh, surveillance. It does not prevent uh, particularly legitimate targeted surveillance, um, but it returns the intelligence and law enforcement world to the more traditional means of investigative investigation, which have fewer implications for our rights writ large as a society. Let's talk a little more about your personal story. Uh, you decide that you've got to do this. You ask 27 countries for asylum. People are, uh, shall we say, less familiar, particularly now with seven years of uh, distance between it. Uh, what exactly happened in 2013? Uh, so I left the United States and met with journalists in a hotel room in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was selected because it was a kind of no man's land that had very good media access. It had a largely unfiltered internet, neither of which is true today, unfortunately. Um, but it was very easy for journalists to operate. It was very easy for me to access uh, as a U.S. intelligence employee uh, without popping up on any radars or anything like that. Um, and uh, I would meet with them there. And China also would not necessarily be free to op operate against us, particularly in the way they can today, because of rivalries and friction and bureaucratic infighting between the local Hong Kong services and the uh, Beijing government. Uh, so this was really an ideal kind of no man's land in which to operate. I provided them with documents and explained the significance of them. Uh, and I didn't publish any documents. This is important for people to understand. I didn't put anything online. Uh, I instead told the journalists uh, to look through this, uh, explained it, and if they felt, uh, as I did, that this was in the public interest to know, uh, they would need to make an independent editorial judgment uh, that this was the case. Go to the government in advance of publication, uh, give the government a chance to argue against this, say uh, that Snowden guy's crazy, or he doesn't understand this, or this document's incorrect, or if you publish this, people will get hurt. Uh, basically, give the government the best chance to argue against this. 
uh, which the government took in almost all cases that I'm aware of. And they um, talked to the White House and talked and to they governments. Talked to the White House. Exactly. Uh, what happened was, as I mentioned before, I had had uh, a decade's worth of history, uh, and actually more than a decade's worth of history, uh, of cases to look over. I looked at Daniel Ellsberg in the case of the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s uh, and the injunction against uh, the newspapers working with him, how that was resolved by the courts, what that meant. I looked at the case of Thomas Drake, uh, <coughs> how even though he went through the right channels, uh, he ended up at the same uh, place where his story, unfortunately, didn't get out. He faced enormous consequences. Policy and the public were unable to grapple with this very important issue because of the government suppression of it. And then I looked at the case of WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning with the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs. Uh, and one of the interesting things against this was Manning, uh, of course, was arrested. Uh, and they said, you know, Manning had uh, blood on her hands, uh, cost the lives of all these soldiers. And, you know, uh, publishing this material, which was only secret, not si top secret, uh, was going to cause basically that the atmosphere to catch fire and the oceans to boil off. And none of this happened. And in fact, at Manning's sentencing, the judge specifically asked the government, uh, do you want to argue that people were harmed as a result of this? Uh, do you want to say, you know, um, someone was hurt, someone died, anything like this, because we'll take it into our sentencing consideration and give a harsher sentence. And the government said, actually, no, we can't show that. It doesn't exist. Uh, and this is what we saw actually in the case of Ellsberg. It's a constant uh, refrain where the government goes, uh, whenever they're put in the hot seat, they don't want to talk about the concrete harms of their policy. They don't want to talk about how they violated rights. Uh, they don't want to talk about how they broke the law. Instead, they want to shift the conversation to the whistleblower, to the source of the disclosure. Say they're weird, say they're disloyal, say they have problems, say they shouldn't have done this for whatever reason. Say that you're going to get spies killed or you're going to reveal troop movements. Precisely. What they want to do is talk about the theoretical risks of journalism in an open society uh, instead of the concrete demonstrated harms as documented by the government's own malpractice. Uh, and so this was something that I anticipated. This was why this uh, sort of process was designed. I used three different journalists at three different outlets. Um, they could all go uh, to the government. The government would get a chance to do this. So we could demonstrate we had gone in theoretically the most responsible way. Um, we had done everything the government thought was proper and appropriate as compared to prior cases and see if it made a difference. And the interesting thing is, uh, even though this was uh, sort of tremendously indulgent of the government's interests, uh, it didn't make a single change in their messaging. Uh, they used the same rhetoric against me as they did with Manning, uh, as they did with Drake, as they did um, with Ellsberg. Uh, but from here, uh, I left uh, Hong Kong en route to Latin America. Um, and uh, I tell this story in my book, Permanent Record, how it happened. Um, but as I was leaving Hong Kong, the government, we're not sure, uh, there, there's no uh, true way to know whether this was an intentional strategic decision or whether they panicked and it was just a mistake. But once they learned, the government had learned that I had departed Hong Kong, they canceled my passport, which meant I couldn't leave Russia. Uh, and I spent the next, you know, uh, 30 days and 30 nights, basically, um, trapped in this Russian airport, Chiremetyevo, uh, trying to get asylum from, as you said, these 27 different countries, things that Americans wouldn't be particularly concerned with, you know, Germany, France. Uh, and every time one of these companies, or companies, one of these countries uh, would appear uh, to be leaning towards granting asylum, saying, OK, come here, uh, they would get a phone call from one of two people. Uh, then Secretary of State um, John Kerry, or soon to be possibly, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and this is, a, this is the interesting thing. Why would the U.S. government work so hard to keep me trapped in Russia rather than allow me to go to a jurisdiction where they would be much freer to operate? Uh, and much more comfortable realistically like France or Germany or Iceland or something like that, uh, if they had even the slightest doubt about my loyalty. Uh, and this is something, a question that even to this day I have difficulty answering.